gas fields. 40 kilometers long and 10 kilometers wide and containing over 300 billion cubic meters of gas, it's called Oman Lang. Oman Lang is locked in an icy tomb 3,000 meters below the sea, so deep and so remote that it's considered beyond the reach of man and machine. But the engineers at the Norwegian energy company Norsk Hydro decide that it's too tempting to ignore because it contains enough gas to supply 20% of the UK's needs for 40 years. The Norwegian engineers know that there's an expanding market for natural gas in Britain because the coal traditionally used to power the economy there is no longer sustainable. Foreign gas is increasingly being used to power the turbines that create the electricity for homes and factories, and the country needs more of it. So the engineers come up with a plan. It will take 10 years and cost 10 billion US dollars. First, they'll drill the Ormond Lang gas deposit, transport the gas 120 kilometers to one of Norway's largest processing plants at Nihamna, and then send the processed gas down the Langelet pipeline to the UK a total distance of 1,200 kilometers. But to build the world's longest subsea pipeline this far and this deep will mean overcoming some major obstacles. They'll need to drill nearly 2,000 meters through the seabed to tap the gas field. To do this, they'll use a rig built right on the sea floor. But the first problem is the Storega slide. The pipeline that will bring the gas out of the field and deliver it to the plant has to scale this 300-meter underwater cliff face. And the terrain of the sea floor is too rough to lay pipe on, so they'll need to trench it. The gas itself is a dangerous mixture of debris and frozen water, capable of blowing a processing plant apart, so they'll need to adapt the system to handle this gas. The plant is big enough to turn through 70 million cubic meters each day. To handle this massive job, they amass some of the largest industrial ships in the world, each designed to tackle a specific phase of the deep sea construction. Out here in the harsh North Sea, humans are confined to the topside world. But beneath the waves, the brawn work is done by underwater remote operated vehicles, or ROVs. These machines are so technologically advanced that they're almost the stuff of science fiction. It's a monumental challenge, but with so much gas industry money behind them, the engineers can dare to dream. But are they going too far? Can they make the dream come true? Or will the project become a nightmare? First, they search the world for a gas well platform which will work in these torturous seas. Existing designs all fall short. The weather here is too stormy and the water too deep. So they come up with an ingenious solution. If they can't bring the gas up to a rig, why not take a rig to the gas? Inside this warehouse in Tonsberg on the coast of Norway, the key to solving this engineering challenge is built. In a daring move, the engineers combine the function of a surface platform with a seabed drill guide. Called a template, it's essentially an underwater gas platform that will guide the drills through to the gas field and control the well flow. Conventional gas platforms are surface structures manned by an army of workers. But in this case, the platform will be dropped onto the seabed where it's clear of the wild North Sea weather. A drill ship will then dock to it and from above guide the drills through to the gas field. When the drilling is done and the gas is flowing, the drill ship will depart, leaving the template to control the wells. Four of these monsters will be mounted onto the seabed and through them, a total of 24 wells will be able to siphon over 70 million cubic meters a day from the gas field. The template will then direct and control the gas flow to a shore-based plant. The entire unit will be operated by remote control from a manned center 120 kilometers away. Richard Bainan is a subsea engineer.
The main thing that you've got, the difficulty that you've got, is it's dark, it's, you know, it's the devil of a job to put it in in the first place. You, you, you've got to get this equipment onto the floor. It's highly valued, highly priced piece of equipment. And then you've got to put it together with robots and you've got to make sure it doesn't leak. And it, it, apart from that, it's easy. The stakes are huge. The engineers have to build it to withstand pressures that would crush a normal submarine. And it has to operate flawlessly for more than 40 years in a harsh saltwater environment. Once it leaves this warehouse and is lowered to the sea floor, there will be no going back. It will be committed to the seabed forever. The 1,000 ton structure can't float on its own, so it's loaded onto a seagoing barge for transport to the drop site. With all the planning and building behind them, it's now the weather that will determine if the mission is a success or a failure. They plan the four-day journey to the drop site to coincide with summer, the season of the calmest seas. Not that that means much out here in the North Atlantic. They rendezvous with the world's largest crane ship, the Thialf, a super crane that does heavy lifts at sea. The two cranes mounted on board can lift over 14,000 metric tons, about 80 747 jumbo jets. The barge and Thialf wait for a weather window before lift operations can begin. The contract to install the subsea component is worth 21 million US dollars. With so much at stake, they do a practice run back on shore. The crane and ROV operators rehearse the drop in a 3D virtual underwater world to simulate the one they'll be working in. Weather, depth and weight will all be against them. Finally, it's time for the real thing. Lines are connected and the record-breaking sea drop begins. This is their only chance. If they miss and the structure settles on the seabed in the wrong place, they'll have to build another one and set the project back by a year. Computer-controlled thrusters hold the crane ship over the drop site. As it drops below the surface, the underwater ROVs go into action and take over as the eyes of the operation, feeding video back to the control room. The engineers scan the rig for problems as the pressure increases. From 1,000 meters below, the ROV sends video back to the crane operator, who then adjusts the orientation. The ball bearing has to be kept as close as possible to the center of the bullseye. He keeps the drop going even when it's just meters away from the sea floor. There's no stopping it now. The template is down and so heavy that the legs on the base sink eight meters into the seabed. But the engineers won't know if they've hit the right spot until they check the coordinates. Readings show it's within 40 centimeters of their target close enough to be considered a perfect drop, and it was accomplished from 1,000 meters above on a rolling sea. Now that the template has been successfully placed, the next step is to tap the gas field. It will take two years to drill the first eight wells, and they'll need to be ready to go before the pipeline can be connected. A specialized drilling ship called the West Navigator is moved into position over the top of the gas field. The Orman Lang gas wells will be the largest deep water wells drilled in the world. The engineers use a powered drill head operated from the ship. Once assembled, the pipe is lowered through the bottom of the ship and down 1,000 meters to the template. From there, the drill head travels another 2,000 meters through the seabed to the gas deposit. It then snakes its way through the gas pockets. Every step of the way is monitored and recorded in a virtual database which is always expanding and is used by engineers and surveyors to plot the next drilling position. Back on land, the team can enter the cave, an amazing 3D undersea simulation. By virtually passing over the seabeds in the gas find, they can locate the most promising parts of the deposit. From the cave, Jens Grinsgaard can plot the drill's movement. With a joystick, I can also fly in this world by just using it, this tip here, and using my movements of my hand to steer myself through this reservoir.
process, data collected by the drill is sent back in real time to the database. The computer then generates images which put the team right in the gas deposit. They can pinpoint spots from 10 kilometers away with astonishing accuracy. That would be compared to that your dentist would be in the 10th floor and you would be situated in the first floor and he's going to fill out one of your tooths back there. We're getting extremely good results by doing this. The template gets its power from the land through a 125 kilometer long control cable called an umbilical. This cable carries huge amounts of electricity, enough to power 20,000 homes. Combined in the umbilical cable are tubes carrying hydraulic fluid, fiber optics, and electrical cables. The welds on these tubes have to be as strong as the welds on the pipeline. This is the fuel and control connection to the template. Without it, the template would just be 1,000 tons of useless metal at the bottom of the North Atlantic. Because the cable is so long, it's built in a factory on the dock, and as it's made, it's fed onto a giant spool on the deck of the Scandi Neptune. Once the entire cable is spooled up, it heads out to the Orman Lang gas field to connect the control room to the four underwater templates. But now the engineers have to prepare the seabed. The bottom of the ocean under the North Sea is a treacherous place, and the team building the world's longest underwater pipeline is about to face a mountain of trouble. 8,000 years ago, two pieces of Norway, each about 300 square kilometers, slid into the sea, causing a mega tsunami. The landslide, known in Norwegian as the Storrega, created a huge shelf in the ocean's topography. The Oman Lang gas field is on the edge of the Storrega, locked inside the huge depression left behind by the slide. This underwater disaster created a mountainous seabed with peaks that rise between 25 and 55 meters. The biggest concern for Hydro is how to get the pipeline up the Storrega slide face, a whopping 300 meters. Underwater surveys reveal a rugged and fractured seabed, but any unstable sediment has long ago disappeared. The rock is more than stable enough, and it would take a new ice age to dismantle it again. But the study has made the engineers more aware of the seabed and the pathway they'll need to clear for the pipeline that will connect the underwater gas rig to the land. First, they need to build a 3D model of the sea floor and find the easiest route. To do this, they create a virtual reality program. The fisheries in the North Sea comprise a huge industry. And Hydro has to make sure the pipeline won't damage the reefs where fish feed and fishing boats work. But the concern isn't just the environmental impact at sea, but also on shore, where one of the largest gas plants in Norway is being built. The land connection they've chosen is the small island of Gossen and the tiny community of Nihamne. The destiny of this quiet community will be forever altered now that it's been designated the landing area and processing plant for the Orman Lang gas project. What was once a remote corner of Norway will be transformed into a bustling industrial center. Here, raw gas from the Orman Lang gas field will be converted into usable fuel. But to do this, more than two million cubic meters of rock must be carved